Amen. Yeah. Well, it's not it's not too long, amen. James and Brother Jim go like, what are you talking about? I seen how many verses we're reading here. <laughs> yeah, uh, James is like, and and oh, whoa, how many verses we're we gonna read? Let's turn to Matthew chapter eleven. Are you ready, James? Matthew chapter eleven. Now look down with me down to verse number twenty eight, and we're gonna look at this. I want you to see something, and then we'll uh, go ahead and look into the uh, message tonight. Amen. I'm sure love that God speaks to us through His Word. Amen. Uh, but Matthew chapter eleven. Look down at verse number twenty eight. I I sure love to preach the Word of God. I'm thankful God allows me to do that. Uh, he does. Uh, he does like to use you, my friend. Uh, once you feel the Holy Spirit of God use you for what He's called you, you'll. You'll be addicted. Amen. It's nice to see and hear the word of God speak through you. But Matthew chapter 11, look down at verse number 28. And we'll read down to verse 30 and then we'll pray and ask God to be with us tonight. Are we, are we there? Matthew 11 verse 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Dearly Father God, Lord, we love you. Father, we come to you again tonight. Lord, we ask the Holy Spirit of God would have freedom. Lord, I pray that you'd use me, Father, clear my mind. Father, use my words. Lord, I pray that you withhold things that I shouldn't say. And Father, I pray you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, we'd learn something. That's why we came here, Father, to hear and learn from the Word of God. And Father, we not only want to learn, but Father, we want to apply. Lord, I hope that that's our prayer, that you would apply, help us to apply the Word of God to our lives so they can be more like you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I'll tell you, I was thinking about a thought, uh, and these verses came to my mind I was thinking about this uh, before I started uh, studying here in Matthew chapter 11, but these verses quickly came to my mind. Uh, let me ask you this tonight. I know that we are all weary and uh, heavy laden. Amen. Look at there. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. I like that verse. That is the verse that the Lord kind of used to speak to me. The title of the message is, He is Ready. Capital H. He is Ready. Write that down. I want to try to be your pastor tonight and help you a little bit and teach you some things and some things that God has taught me. Now, it's not whether or not we are heavy laden because he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you. You know, it's interesting. Uh, that tells me that he knows that uh, no matter who you are, you like to take it all on. We forget to come to him. That's why the title is, He is Ready. He is Ready. Let me ask you this, are you? You know, He's Ready. He can take the whole world, amen. I, I used to have a t-shirt uh, when they first came out with them years ago where it showed a, a man holding the uh, world and it says... Uh, uh, the the weight of the world, the, the sin of the world, and showed a man holding it. I also seen another one that says, uh, it would say, bench press this, the sin of the world. You know, actually, in all reality, that's a lot of weight, but not for God. God can handle it all, amen? He's ready to handle it all. The word ready there means that, means quick. He's quick. He's prompt. You know, I like it. The Bible says that uh, we have not because we ask not or we ask amiss. So it's not whether or not he's ready. A lot of times it's because we haven't even asked correctly. But he is ready. He says, come unto me. Huh. Boy, I like that. You know, I could jump into Hebrews chapter number 10 just based on that, come unto me, where the Bible says right there, verse number 23, draw near, nigh unto me. It's talking about draw near. And then verse number 25, he says, uh, forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together. So a part of coming near to God is also uh, the same as uh, uh, coming to church and being faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. So the word ready is quick, prompt, 
Well, that's a that'd be a nice thing to be told of by your employer, wouldn't it? Or one day when you stand before the Lord, wouldn't it be nice for him to say that, boy, you were ready. You were quick when I asked and you were prompt. You did what I asked you to do. He has no hesitations. He's prepared. He furnished with what is necessary. I like this. He's willing. He's free. Well, that, that should make you cry right there. It's free. And he does it cheerfully. He's willing. He's free. And he does it cheerfully. Now that should blow you away. Willing, free, and cheerfully. Now listen to that verse. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you ready tonight? The word labor means that you feel fatigued. The word labor there means that you are weary. You're physically, mentally weary. You see, it's not just a physical weariness. And believe me, uh, I'm sure we all know uh, the, the difference between a physical fatigue and a mental fatigue. And let me help you. Uh, my God is ready to help whether it's physical or mental. You know, the, there are people who have mental fatigue due to physical fatigue. There are people that have mental fatigue, and because they're mentally fatigued, they're exhausted physically. Labor is difficulty. It's an exertion. Now listen, this is why we get this is why we get fatigued, and this is in the meaning of labor. Listen to this. It means it's an exertion of one's own power. So you know when you get fatigued, my friend, it's because you're doing it on your own. Uh, I don't know, I'm going to be honest with you, and I can't remember a lot because uh, since September, a lot of things have been kind of a blur. I've uh, not had a very good memory like I normally do. You can ask my wife. Uh, but I've had a lot of people ask me, how do you keep going? When only way, the only place you look is one you're not worried about how you keep going. Let me, let me help you. The greatest Christians, if you go look at the greatest testimonies of all time, they're not looking all other areas or trying to figure out how to keep going. They just keep looking unto Jesus. You say, how did Paul do it? He, he just kept looking unto Jesus. There's, there's no other way to look. And you say, how did you do it? I didn't. Uh, how did you keep preaching? I didn't. How do you keep going? I don't. He does. You know, I always know when I start exerting my own power is when I start getting discouraged. <laughs> you say, how long? Do you know what? The Lord never tells us how long. can only imagine, I'm sure, and I'm not trying to put my wife on the spot, I'm sure she's asked the Lord, how long? Let me help you what, don't ask that question because you begin to exert your own power. I actually, I'm a verbal person, so I try to, I, I, I usually say what's in my head, and so we'll be in, the, in, our, in our one room, amen, our, our one little house, which is a blessing, and I'll say, you know what, how long? You say, what, how long will we be sick? Huh. Wrong question, isn't it? That's the exertion of one's own power. The Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor, all ye that exert your own power. 
Are you listening? He's saying, hey, instead of thinking about this on your own, you're supposed to come to me. I may not make it through this. The word, the phrase, come unto me, you know what that means? I, I love this. Be by my side. I want you to come be by my side. That means he's accessible. He's ready, friend. He wants you to be by his side. It's up to you to come to his side. But he is acceptable or accessible for you to be by his side. He's placed himself in a way where you can be near him. He says, I want you to come unto me. You know, that also means relationship. It's really hard to walk close to somebody if you do not have a relationship. Am I right? Have you ever walked close to somebody? Come on now, at the airport or mall, isn't that, isn't that weird? I don't know about you, I, I told you I'm the type of person that likes to talk, so uh, if I'm standing too long next to somebody I don't know, I'm going to say something. Right, ask my wife. Huh? I'm going to say something, right? Hey, we should say something, right? I mean, how long are you going to stand there? I mean, uh, how, how, many, how many people have you been next to for a long period of time, and they just come off arrogant, they don't want to say anything to you? Well, that's not how we're supposed to be. If you're going to be near Christ, you say, well, I'm near Christ, but we don't ever talk. Oh, no, you're not near him. You're not near him. To be near somebody is to, be, to not only physically be there, but to mentally be there and to have a relationship. This is a physical and mental nearness. Isn't that neat? It's a physical and mental labor, and it's a physical and a mental nearness that he wants, that he desires. He not only wants you, but he wants you mentally. He wants the whole you. That's what he means when he says, come unto me. Now, the word laden, laden is another type of word, and uh, I'm trying to think of a good picture. We all know that sand is not real. He's a myth. Uh, but you know, it's harder to think of anything else but a, a man packing a bag full of junk and putting it on his back. And that's what we do with our, when, we're, when we exercise things on our own. It's called burdens that we pack on our back. Laden is a loaded charged with a burden and oppression. When we don't come to the Lord, we become so burdened and oppressed and anxious and depressed, we feel weighted down. Now notice the verse. It says, and are heavy laden. So when we labor on our own and our, exert our own power, we become heavy laden. We literally burden our own selves to the ground. And then the Lord says, come unto me and I will give you rest. The word rest now... How many of how many? I, I'm going to raise my hand because I have. I've labored on my own and I've felt oppressed. Come on, don't lie to me. I've labored on my own and I've felt oppressed. Do you know? Let me help you with this because the word rest there, uh, and when I've done that, my mind goes everywhere, and anxiety sets in, and you know you almost have a panic. Yeah, you can take gabapentin. That's fine, but you're still. It's not going to leave your brain. But God can give you rest. And what that word rest there means, quiet. I have a lot of questions when I get burned. Yeah. I feel like Lucy's husband. Yes, Lord, you have some splaining to do. Right? But God doesn't have any experience. I'm 
sorry about that. God doesn't have any explaining to do. We do. God wants to give us quiet. He wants to quiet your mind. He wants to give you peace. You know what he wants? I'm talking about our Savior here. This is him that's talking, by the way. He wants to bring reconciliation. You know, when he calls you that still small voice, that's him saying, will you reconcile with me? Will you come back to me? Oh, I long for you. The only way that we can get real sleep is through God. Did you know that? Because you can't sleep. You know, the interesting thing is when you go through a lot of things and a lot of burdens, you become anxious and depressed. And usually nights are the worst, aren't they? We know they are. All of us do. I don't believe there's one person in the whole entire world that think nights are the best. When you're sick or when you're going through a tragedy, nights are the worst. The Bible says joy comes in the morning. But God can give us sleep. You know, one thing that's helped me, and I believe that uh, we learn this from the Old Testament, is that when Saul was oppressed by wicked spirits, he had David come play uh, godly music, and uh, godly music kept what? The evil spirits away. I've been doing that for quite a while. I turn it, really, I turn it down really light so I don't keep her up, but loud enough so it can penetrate my ears so that all I can hear is praises to my Savior all night long. You know, sometimes we had to have the praises going in, so we'll praise going out. Rest means hope. It's hard to rest when we have no hope. You say, well, Pastor, I'm saved. I've got hope. That's not the hope he's talking about there. I want you to understand there's Christians who are heavy laden and are burdened, and uh, they can't rest because they don't act like they have any hope. We do. We have hope. I want to look at Jesus and who he is tonight if I've got time. Matthew chapter 14 and verse number 14. Turn there with me just a couple pages over. I want you to see some things about Jesus. That's who's speaking, who's saying, come unto me. He's saying, I'm, I'm ready. Are you? I'm here. Are you going to come? I'm calling you. Will you come to me? Look at Matthew 14 and verse number 14. I want you just to see some amazing things about our, our Savior. And it says, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with what? compassion toward them and he healed their sick i want you to i want you just to see a few things about our savior tonight proving to you excuse me proving to you that he is ready he's ready amen number one i want you to see in verse number 14 of matthew chapter 14 that he is ready and compassionate as a healer he is ready as a compassionate healer I don't know about you, I like that, hey amen. Uh, there's a lot of things I need healing from. Now, I'm not just talking about healing from uh, physical ailments, but he also can heal you mentally. And the, the great thing about our healer, Jesus, is he's compassionate. He's painful, he has a painful sympathy or sorrow for and love for you. There's no one else that has as much love or sympathy for you than Jesus. Now, here's a good explanation. Unless you didn't have good parents, amen. Uh, you know, there are some people that didn't have very good mothers or good fathers, and uh, it's not a very good example. Or, you know, but that's not the way God created it. You know that God created the family. Uh, now, think about this with, with me. He created the family, father, mother, and children. Uh, God the Father as a representation of the Father. Uh, God the Son as a representation of the Mother. Because Jesus is the one who compassionately, sorrowfully, painfully loves you. He's the one who came and died on the cross for you. He hasn't changed his character. 
you have. He asks this evening in a compassionate, healing way, are you ready? Psalm 78 and verse number 38, I'm just going to pull a portion out of that verse. It says, but he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity. I'm so thankful that my Savior is full of compassion for me. <laughs> Man, I definitely don't have a uh, full of compassion sometimes. Now, I'll, I'll have sorrow and sympathy for myself. Uh, boy, that's selfish, isn't it? The word healer means to restore a compassionate healer. He loves you and has sorrow for you and he wants to restore you. But he can't do that unless you're ready and you come to him. He wants to relieve you. He wants to cure you. He wants to make you whole. This is a good message for lost people. He wants to restore purity. He wants to forgive you. You know, I don't, you got to remember, child of God, we still have to make sure our relationship is healed. When we do that, which is wrong against the Savior, we still got to make sure our relationship is healed. And I believe I've explained the relationship of God the Father and God the Son to you before, but as far as God the Father, the law that has been paid for, but as far as our Savior and our healer, uh, he's who we sin against, the one who died for our sins. He wants you to restore your relationship with him. He wants to forgive you, reconcile you. He also, when he heals you, do you know what that does? It helps you to do something. It's called grow. Number two, turn with me to Acts chapter number 23. This is interesting. Acts chapter 23. Look down with me at verse number one. I just wanted you to see the whole story. I'm not, I'm not using every verse. I'm just using one, but I want you to see the whole story. So look at verse number one. We'll go down to verse 11. That's the verse I want. Because that's where Jesus is speaking is right there. But if you look at verse number 1, it says, And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, is everybody there? Said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee. <laughs> well, he's, well, I'm, that's funny, isn't it? <laughs> thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? He knew them. And they stood by, and they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But when Paul perceived that one part uh, were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and the resurrection of the dead, and I am called in question. And when he had said so, or when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Hypocrites. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled into pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the night following the Lord, listen to this, and the night following the Lord did what? Stood by him, and what did he say? Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, 
so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Are you listening? It says, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer. I like that. He's ready to be the encouraging helper. (laughs) Not really much of a helper. He does all the work, right? The big part is that he's there to encourage. Notice what he says to Paul. Be of good cheer. You know what I like the most is that Paul was near him. He stood near him. The Lord cannot encourage you if you're not near Him. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 11 in verse 28, Come unto me, I'll give you rest. You see, how did Paul do this? Because he was unto him. And all things, I I love that man, He, he got smart with them guys, didn't he? Because God was near him. Jesus was near him. He was an encouraging helper. Be of good cheer. Do you know what that means? That means to have courage or be comforted. Huh. Encourage and courage are the same thing, basically. Because encourage means to give courage. But God says here, He says, be of good cheer. Have courage. He's encouraging him and comforting him. That's why I got the title, Encouraging Helper. The Lord will give you encouraging or courage, because encourage means to give courage, to give confidence of success. Now, he didn't feel too successful, I'm sure. But Jesus was there to give him confidence of success, to inspire him, and to give him, here's what we need, strength of mind. Strength of mind. I I put in here the the meaning of helper. He literally is not our helper, but in, in 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 a way he is. He only helps when we're near. Have you ever heard, uh, I know I've said this before and something I've learned, and I, I hate this because I like to help people, but you can't help people unless they come to you for help. Have you ever heard that? Come on. Do you know that you can see people, they need help, they need Jesus as their Savior. You think you're going to save them? No, you're not. You can only lead people to the Lord who are actually seeking for Him. Do you know, I can know that someone's doing something wrong, and if I go over there and tell them it's wrong, it's going to make them mad. It don't matter if I, I can show them my license. I can tell them how long I've been doing it. They're just going to think I'm arrogant. Now, I could ask them. But that's still kind of, if they're not looking for help, normally they don't care what you have to say. Have you ever found that out? Huh? You know what's interesting too is uh, there'll be people that I know that know I'm a plumber and I would have gladly have helped them by showing them what to do instead of asking me and letting me draw it out or show them because I don't have a problem doing that. You don't have to pay me to give you some wisdom or some knowledge. And, uh, but instead of doing that, they just went ahead and did it themselves and they got all the plumbing in and uh, now they're uh, renting that place to somebody and now they can't get the uh, sewer gas smell out. And so then they call me to come look at it and I come look at it and I said, well, if you would ask me before you put all the plumbing in the walls and the floor I can't do anything about it it's all plumb wrong see how stubborn we are that's what the Lord is saying here I can't encourage or help you I can't give you aid if you don't come unto me I can't give you the rest you need or the aid you need like I did Paul if you're not near me See, I just want God to speak through me. Like I want, I want to be able to read my Bible and see it as you do, Pastor. Then get in it. You know, I'll tell you one of my desires after I finally uh, surrendered to preach was that uh, that that you know I want I want Lord speak to me. I want show me uh, show me how to. You know, it takes a lot of study. They don't just give it to you. I was just telling my wife the other day, we were talking the other night, and uh, she asked me a question about something, and as I began to answer, I felt the transformation in in bed 
of all of a sudden I was not her husband anymore. I was the pastor. And the Holy Spirit of God grabbed a hold of me and I began to, I wasn't trying to preach, but that's, it was like a light preaching where I'm, and I could tell the Holy Spirit was pouring out. It's because of a lot of study. I didn't study to preach that message. It was stuff that God had showed me that he developed when someone asked me a question. He can do that for you. I'm nobody. Paul said he was the chiefest of sinners. He can do that for Paul. He can do that for you. He says, come unto me, all ye. All. He wants us all. Oh, no, pastor, he wants you more. You know, the closer you get to the Lord, the more you know that's not true. It's a shame. I think it's a shame when the church lives off of uh, encouragement and, and, and they live off of it from Sunday and then they wait till Wednesday, then they wait till Sunday. It, that's a shame. But here we see Jesus telling Paul to be of good cheer. He encourages him. He is an encouraging helper. He wants to aid you as well. He wants to be the one that furnishes or administers a remedy that's what he's doing here with Paul. He's furnishing and administering a remedy, one that supplies. You know what, for me, just to hear him say be, that's enough. Because I know he's, it says that the Lord stood by him and said, be, I've done enough for me. <laughs> Why? Because it's the Lord. He just made himself known. I know he's there. He's the one that furnishes or administers a remedy, one that supplies the need. Number three, look at Psalms, I believe that's 46. <laughs> Sad we can't read your own writing. Did I tell you Psalms 46, James? Okay. Try to quickly get through this. All right, one through seven. Look at this with me really quick. It says, God is our refuge and strength. <laughs> I love this verse. A very present help in trouble. Just so you know, in the New Testament, it says, Come unto me, all you labor. He's talking about these people. He's letting you know that he can give you refuge in your trouble. I can give you strength in your trouble. Verse 2 says, therefore, as, and all, we, we know that any time the Bible says therefore, it's therefore because of what he just said. Because he already knows that you're in trouble, therefore will not we fear. Why won't we fear? Because God is our refuge and a strength, a very present help in trouble. How did Paul get that? Because he knew that God was near. Jesus had said that he stood near and he did what? And he said, be of good cheer. Though the earth be, be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Well, that sounds awful. Though the waters there, uh, thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with swelling thereof. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her and that right early. And the heathen raged, and the kingdoms were moved, and he uttered his voice, and the earth melted. That's how powerful our Lord is. And it says, and the Lord of hosts is, this should make you cry, is with us. But the God of Jacob is our refuge. Amen. The God that was the God in the Old Testament is still our God today. God is our refuge. It's not can be or should be, it says, is our refuge. The problem is you haven't made him your refuge because you haven't come unto him. Number three is, he's ready to be your refuge and strength. He's ready to be a compassionate healer. He is ready to be an encouraging helper. He is ready 
to be a refuge and strength. The word refuge means a shelter from danger, protection from distress, stronghold, sanctuary, safety, inaccessible by the enemy. Don't you like that? Strength means, now this is interesting, the word strength here says refuge and strength. The first thing I saw when I looked that word up was praise. You want to know what's interesting? God desires our praise. And when we're in his refuge, we'll give him praise, which is our strength. Huh. Do you know what strengthens us? Praising him. Strength also said it's boldness. So we'll be able to praise with boldness. Then it goes on to say that it's might, power, and security. But the meaning of that word starts off with praise and boldness. Can't have that unless you're in the shelter, in the refuge. It says a very present help in trouble. Do you know what it tells me? It tells me he's ready, he's near, just like he was with Paul. He was there. Waiting on you. Are you ready? He's ready. He's ready and near. He's in the company with. You say, well, I don't hear him. <laughs> you're, you're not listening. Do you know, <laughs> there is no ambulance. That can be there quicker than him. It says he's a quick in emergency. You don't have to push any buttons. It's already there. When Peter fell in the water, all he had to say was help. And he was there. Instantaneous. You know, Peter knew he did wrong by taking his eyes off the Lord. The Lord didn't cast judgment on his wrongness. The Lord waited for his help. Do you know, Peter could have gurgled in under water. God would have got it, and he would have pulled him out. That's how quick. You can't help if you don't want help. Attentive. Very present means he's attentive. Did you know he's there? I like that because... Uh, you know, if you have animals, you know that they like to have you to be attentive to them, don't they? Do you know that the Lord is attentive to you? He knows what's going on in your heart. But we haven't brought it to Him. Come ye all that are... Come unto me. You know what he's saying? I'm ready. I understand you hurt. I understand your pain. I understand your, your loss. Me and my wife are reading this book. And uh, it's a counseling book. And the last chapter we read had to do with loss. It was talking about there's all kinds of loss in our lives. You know, as we get older, we lose our strength. That's a loss. Did you know that? It's mentally hard. There's all kinds of loss that we have in our life, and each one of us grieves each one of those losses, and they compound themselves. The Lord says, come unto me. We're to bring those losses to him. He wants to give us a refuge. He wants us to have strength. He wants you to understand that he's present, attentive, and he exists at all times. Just so you know, while you sleep, he watches. With God present, verse number two, it says, Therefore, we'll not we fear. 
There's no reason to fear with God present. Number four, we're gonna I'm gonna look at this. Turn over to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Really quick, just a couple of verses, verse 13 through 15. You got to hear the end of it. Are you there? It says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Huh, that's going to make me cry again. Jesus says, You are my friends. We haven't been too friendly, have we? He says, ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. That's special. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Let's try not to cry out. He's ready to be your friend. You say, he's my savior. Yeah, but is he your friend? It says, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. He did that for you. He says, ye are my friends. He also says, but I have called you friends. A friend is one that's attached by affection. A friend is one who respects. You say, I wish he would just make me do these things. That's not a friend. That's not love. He stands near waiting for you. Right? You know, uh, what you learn in marriage is that, you know, when you mess up, you have to allow your spouse room to you know get upset and deal with it you can't you can't force your spouse to forgive you Jesus already forgave you but he's not going to force you that's what I want you to get out of that he's not the one that's waiting or you you're he's the one waiting not not you he's not the one upset He called you his friend even before you were saved. Huh. Psalms or Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loveth at all times. That's talking about Jesus, my friend. And then you put that other verse together. Greater love. That sounds like my Savior, don't it, you? My Redeemer. That sounds like Jesus. He is the one. He's the one who's opened eternal life and the way to everlasting salvation. He's the purchaser. He paid in full. He's our Savior if we only accept Him. He, he is the giver. He is the donor. He is the bestower. <laughs> He's the grantor. He's the one who imports or distributes. It is the gift. Listen, this is a quote. This is not my quote. It is the giver, not the gift, that engrosses the heart of the Christian. It is the giver, not the gift. That engrosses the heart of the Christian. You'll get that in a minute. Friends, church, he's ready. We are heavy burdened. He's ready as a compassionate healer. He's ready to be an encouraging helper. He's ready to be your refuge and strength. And finally, not lastly, we could probably go on for a long time for everything he is. But he's ready to be your friend. Are you ready? 
Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. We'll have just a short time of invitation. He's ready. Are you ready?